to our session. So excited to be back with Databricks and to the summit. We have been working with Databricks for quite some time, partnering and been part of you know, the summit for many years. Used to be live summit, of course, you know, over the last couple of years changed to the virtual, but I'm so glad we are back here and hosting this, um, this important, you know, meetup and also, as Karen mentioned, the panel discussion later in the week. I'm just going to give you a couple of minutes on the woman in big data and invite you to join us. We started this woman in big data in 2015. We started it just with a simple question in our own organization. I'm actually with Intel. I've been with Intel for, for many, many years, almost 30 years with Intel in many different roles. But one of the discussion we had in 2015 was around, you know, why do we have such a a short, small representation of female in our organization. We had a data, big data organization, analytics organization, and we had such a small representation. And that was alarming for, for everyone. And we were asked to look into it. And of course, you know, we called uh, to some of our partners, our companies that we used to work with, and we got together in 2015. And sure enough, that wasn't just the story within Intel. It was pretty much across you know, the board. Uh, we discussed with IBM, Microsoft, SAP, and several other companies. And we started that, you know, let's just start you know, the a forum so we can make awareness and start you know, really discussing it more globally. And with 15 of us, 15 members in that June of 2015, um, really, you know, we grow it globally. Uh, we are now over 17,000 members. Uh, we started with one chapter in Bay Area, and now we are over 40 chapters, to be exact, 41 chapters in multiple different regions, including, of course, North America, several chapters in North America, and in US and Canada, in Latin America, in Europe, Middle East, Africa, Asia, uh, both in South Asia and in East Asia and uh, Australia. So it's exciting to see how much we have grown. We provide a lot of, you know, training, soft skill training, you know, technical training, workshop. We provide, you know, mentorship opportunity. We provide a lot of networking opportunity. It's a really safe and welcoming, you know, platform that we provide to our members. And they are able to take, you know, really, you know, get their skills, you know, um, beefed up and get opportunity, we have a job board, and we do invite you know, uh, those that they are looking for talents and our members to really you know, uh, understand what is needed in order to get the next opportunity that they are looking for. Uh, so we do a lot of awareness with that one. We are present in all the social medias that probably you are aware of, including um, a lot of you know, good presence at LinkedIn, both at the company level and at the forum level. And we have at the, you know, Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook, uh, definitely you can find us all. And our website, uh, womaninbigdata.org, that invites you to, to really you know, visit and learn about you know, our programs. And we always you know, looking for more volunteers and opportunity to really you know, provide to our members. So anyone interested, you can either contact me, shallow.arshi at womaninbigdata.org, or you can go to the website and try to contact us. So we are very excited to have you here. Thank you so much for joining. And I would like to pass it back to Karen to start you know, our actual technical presentation. Thank you, Karen. Take it from here. Thanks, Jala. Um, all right. OK, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Amali. She is head of content and community at Monte Carlo. So Molly, please take it away. Thanks, Karen. And thanks so much for the, for the great intro, Shala. Um, this is such a fantastic group, and I'm so happy to be here. Um, so let me share my screen, screen quickly. Um, you may have noticed right off the bat that I am not Bar Moses, who was originally intended to, to talk today. Um, Bar actually recently had her second COVID vaccine and so is, is having some um, not so fun side effects. She's fine, but, but like everyone else, um, 
you know, just she she unfortunately could not could not be here today. So I am subbing in for her and you're stuck with me. So um, again, I want to thank you for for having me. Um, as Karen mentioned, my name is Molly and I'm head of content in community at Monte Carlo, um, as well as a member of their founding team. Um, so for some background, Monte Carlo is a data reliability company backed by Excel, GGV, Redpoint, and other Silicon Valley investors that help companies trust their data pipelines and ML, and ML models through automated data observability, which is something that I will talk a bit about. Bit about, and so um, I know that one of the themes today is how to build more reliable and scalable data pipelines um, and models, and so observability um, very much is is a tenant of that. So we'll discuss that a bit today. Um, but um, you know, before Monte Carlo, I was the managing editor editor um, for the Uber engineering blog, and so I worked with a lot of um, the data and AI teams there to kind of help them write and communicate um, about the work that they were doing. Um, so it gives me great pleasure to talk about some of the industry's biggest trends um, and topics today. So today, in a nutshell, I'll walk through um, the difference between model-centric and data-centric machine learning and why it matters, um, why the best data and machine learning teams are adopting software engineering best practices to tackle quality and reliability at scale, and finally, what these tactics might look like in practice. Um, and so hopefully you'll leave here with about one or two tactical tips that you can take and implement to your own data pipelines and model development processes immediately. All right, so let's see here. All right, so as I mentioned, uh, my name is Molly. I started at Monte Carlo about a year ago. Um, prior to that, I oversaw the Uber engineering blog and the Uber um, AI review process. Um, I was also co-lead of the Women at Uber book club. So writing, reading, often about tech is, is very much in my DNA. Um, and so at Uber, I helped our engineering, AI, and data science teams tell stories about their work um, from building our machine learning platform, Michelangelo, um, to writing about um, our various open source projects. Um, you may have heard of some of them. Um, one was Ludwig and another, I think, in the AI space was Horovod. Um, but before Uber, I was a journalist and I wrote for USA Today where I covered pop culture and American history. And then prior to that, I graduated from Stanford University with a BA, uh, BA in American Studies. Um, so my fun fact is that I actually wrote my honors thesis on Elvis Presley. Um, and the connection to a AI is that OpenAI actually recently, um, or not recently, I guess this was last year, they were able to simulate um, music by some famous pop artists, one of whom being Elvis. Um, and you can actually hear hear what they came up with on SoundCloud. It's very interesting. Um, so that's that's the connection there. Um, but enough about myself. Um, you know, the, the reason that you're here today is to learn about um, how you can make your data pipelines and models more reliable. And so, um, you know, so um, and why and, and how can we do that? Um, so to start, something that we like to talk about a lot is the good pipelines or perhaps good models problem or good models, good pipelines, bad data. Um, and it's an increasingly common problem that a lot of um, data and AI teams are facing. Um, so it's no secret. Um, everyone at your company relies on data in some form or function. Um, in fact, the reason you're probably at this meetup is because you work with data, either as a data scientist, a data engineer, a data analyst, or even an ML engineer. Um, you clean, pipe, transform, model, or analyze data either for your company, personal projects, academia, um, and the onus on data quality is really high. Um, and when I say data quality, I'm referring to the state of the information powering your pipelines and your models, whether at ingest, um, in the pipeline itself, during transformation, um, or as a finished data product, whether that's a report in a dashboard, a data platform, an ML model, or whatever it is. Um, so everyone generally can agree that high quality, reliable data is key for operationalizing data in all of its forms. But if you've worked with data in any meaningful way, you know that reliable and trustworthy data isn't always the reality. In fact, data breaks a lot. Um, ML models drift a lot. And this can cause serious problems for your business and in the real world. 
Um, so obviously you can't really raise your hand um, where, you know, in this Zoom first world, but, um, but I'm imagining you're raising your hand. So raise your hand if you've been on the receiving end of the good models, models bad data problem. And by this, I mean that your processes, your machine learning, your algorithms, and other technologies that are in place to clean, transform, uh, model, model, analyze the data um, are all rock solid, but the data itself breaks or is otherwise unreliable. And a lot of the times you can't tell whether it's the model or the data that is affecting performance. But recent you know recent research that I'll get to indicates that data has an increasingly more important role. Um, so this problem of the good models bad data problem affects nearly every data practitioner um, and and it often happens more likely than we care to admit or even know about and it can have pretty serious implications on your business, um, causing trust in the data to erode um, for your stakeholders, your CEO, your executives, or even your customers. Um, maybe you've been notified of a data issue from an annoyed analyst or a chafed CMO, um, or perhaps someone on your finance team, depending on how production ready your models are. For businesses, this can mean loss of revenue, wasted resources, or even ill-informed decision-making. And in the real world, the consequences of ML models trained on poor data um, can be even more consequential. For example, in 2020, a black man in Detroit was wrongfully arrested and jailed after being misidentified by facial recognition software, likely due to bias issues that include training data sets that are predominantly white and male. And this just scratches the surface. Um, even just doing like a quick Google search, I found um, many headlines uh, citing issues with, with data and, and models when it comes to um, optimizing um, AI. Um, so this brings me to you know my next my next point, um, and I and I broached this a little bit earlier, um, but recently um, you know S Andrew Ng, a Stanford University professor and co-founder of DeepLearning.ai, brought to light some of these issues that I mentioned. This whole discrepancy between data centric versus uh, model centric um, machine learning, um, and. He, um, you know, brought to light that, um, you know, sometimes it makes sense to prioritize data centric machine learning development, um, not to say that model centric isn't important as well. Um, but in fact, he went so far as to say that if 80% of our work is data preparation, then ensuring data quality is the important work of a machine learning team. And often it, it goes, um, you know, it, it, it doesn't get give the get the diligence that it deserves. Um, and so for modern teams, it's really important not just to improve the code we use to build and deploy our models, but the training data itself. Ng suggests that while common practices to hold the data fixed while trying to improve the code, teams should also focus on improving the data itself to make faster progress. And he, he cites several studies um, done by his collaborators um, to support his points, noting that data-centric ML models outperformed in at least three key tests related to building models for different types of algorithms. So I have the link on my screen here, but if you go to that link, um, it'll go straight to his talk and it's, it's a very good one if, if you haven't watched it yet. Um, so in his talk, um, Ng suggests that to reframe machine learning from a model-centric to a data-centric approach, we have to incorporate best practices from software engineering and DevOps. We actually have to apply MLOps to our data and model development pipelines. If AI systems are composed of code and data, as Ng suggests, it's time we start focusing on the underlying quality of our data, as well as the infrastructure that supports this reliability. In fact, you know, taking it a step further um, to give data quality the diligence it deserves and to truly solve the good models, bad data problem, I believe that modern data and ML teams really must leverage the next frontier of our industry, data observability. Um, so before I dig into, oops, sorry, before I dig into um, what data observability is and what it might look like in your data pipelines and ML models, um, I want to pay tribute to um, an individual who is very near and dear to my heart. Um, they make sure that your favorite things like Slack and Netflix don't break, and that if they do, they're fixed before you can say Tiger King. 
This person is responsible for building, maintaining, and fixing broken things at nearly every company. You may, heck, heck you may even be one. Um, I'd like to thank developer operations engineers and more specifically observability engineers. Um, so like Ng, I believe that solving this problem and taking a more data-centric approach to machine learning can be tackled by relying on some best practices of our software engineering friends. Software engineers leverage principles of site reliability and observability to ensure that their applications are performing as expected and that uptime is high while downtime is low. As data organizations grow um, and the underlying stacks powering them become more complicated, it, it, it can be quite helpful to apply similar principles um, to managing and, and growing um, your data pipelines. Um, so specifically, software engineers leverage principles of site reliability and observability to ensure um, that applications perform, um, perform as expected. And in that same way, we should be applying these similar principles to our pipelines and models to ensure that both the code and logic and the data itself is reliable and what should be expected. Um, so, um, you know, a lot of such in a lot of situations, this might be particularly important. Um, consider migrating to a new data warehouse, moving from a kind of monolithic to a data mesh, data mesh architecture. Um, moving from like warehouse to a lake, um, what, whatever it is, um, knowing exactly how healthy your data is can be a very valuable thing. And by applying these DevOps principles, it makes it much more scalable and easier to do. Um, you know, specifically in, in the context of software engineering, um, observability speaks to, um, to this need for reliable systems and refers to the monitoring, tracking, and triaging of incidents to prevent downtime. And as a result of this industry-wide shift to distributed systems in the application realm, um, observability engineering has really emerged as a fast-growing discipline. And at its core, observability engineering is broken into three major pillars, as you can see on my slide, metrics, logs, and traces. Metrics refer to a numeric representation of data measured over time, whereas logs are a record of an event that took place at a given timestamp and provide valuable context regarding when a specific event occurred. And traces represent causally related events in a distributed environment. And on the data side, I've noticed, and perhaps others, others would emphasize with this, that approaches to data reliability and generally data and ML engineering are about 10 years behind software engineering. And in application development, every team has an observability solution like New Relic, Datadog, PagerDuty, so on and so forth to measure the health of their applications and ensure reliability. And yet data teams in many cases are still flying blind. Um, so really solving for this um, good models, bad data problem boils down to leveraging the same principles that DevOps engineers have been using for the past 10 years and applying them to, to our pipelines. Um, so if solving data quality, in other words, not flying blind is easier than you think, um, all it really takes is a holistic automated approach to data observability. So what is data observability? Well, if you hadn't guessed it already, data observability is an organization's ability to fully understand the health of the data in their system. Data observability eliminates data quality issues or at least allows you to identify them sooner um, by applying best practices of DevOps observability to your data pipelines and models. Like DevOps, data observability uses automated monitoring, alerting, and triaging to identify and evaluate data quality and discoverability problems as they arise. This leads to more reliable data, healthier pipelines, and more productive teams. Now, what does data observability look like in practice? It's great to talk about, but what does this even mean? Um, so how can, you, how can we follow in the footsteps of our DevOps counterparts and apply the same principles of observability to our pipelines and models? Um, in the next few slides, I'll outline a few best practices for this that you can take away from this presentation and apply to your own systems. So, just like you have your three pillars of observability for software reliability, every data team has pillars of observability for data reliability. And I've broken these down into five major areas of data health that might be familiar to you. Um, and we often find that they're strong indicators of whether or not something has broken or gone wrong. 
freshness, distribution, volume, schema, and lineage. So the first, first pillar um, is freshness. Um, and freshness seeks to understand how up-to-date your tables are, as well as the cadence at which your tables are updated. Freshness is particularly important when it comes to decision-making, as we all know that stale data is basically synonymous with wasted time and money or poorly trained ML models. The next one is distribution, or a function of your data's possible values. And this tells you if your data is within an accepted range. Data distribution gives you insight into whether or not your tables can be trusted based on what can be expected from your data. The next one is volume. Volume refers to the completeness of your data tables and offers insights on the health of your data sources. So for instance, if 200 million rows suddenly turns into 5 million, you should probably know. And then third, or sorry, fourth is schema. Um, changes in the organization of your data, in other words, schema, often indicates broken data. Um, monitoring who makes changes to these tables and when is foundational to understanding the health of your data ecosystem, not to mention preventing issues from occurring again. And it's important to note that a schema change does not mean that your data is broken, but it means that a change has been made to your data and that um, it can cause issues downstream, um, whether that is re reflected in a dashboard or as you build out um, a model. Um, and then finally, and the one that kind of, at least I think, kind of brings it all together is lineage. Um, when data breaks um, or something happens and you don't know why, um, the first question is always, where, where did it break? Um, where did that change occur? Um, data lineage provides this answer by telling you which upstream sources and downstream ingesters are impacted, as well as which teams are generating the data and who is accessing it and using it. Good lineage also collects information about the metadata that speaks to governance, business, and technical guidelines associated with specific data tables. The lineage really serves as a single source of truth for all data consumers. Um, so tracking these five pillars can give you a good sense of how healthy your data is. And from there, whether or not good models, bad data incidents occur. Um, so kind of moving on, um, it's it's fine to talk about these these pillars, but but what does who actually owns data observability and quality, and what does this look like in the org? Um, you know, data data is really becoming so om, om, omnipresent, um, really for for every company, and everyone kind of touches it in in some way or another, whether that's as an end user, a data scientist, an ML engineer. Um, you know, a data engineer, um, whatever it is. Um, and so it's really important to understand who owns what when it comes to data quality and reliability. Um, to sort of help delineate some of these responsibilities associated with solving the good models, bad data problem, um, and ensuring that a data-centric approach to machine learning is actually scalable, um, Bar and I put together a RACI matrix um, for common data personas. Um, RACI is a term derived, um, I believe, from consulting, um, the world of consulting, um, and it refers to responsible, accountable, consulted, and informed. And it draws inspiration um, from instances where you have a project and you need to understand who is responsible, accountable, so on and so forth for each given element of a project. Um, and so RACI matrices are generally used to assign responsibility um, in the context of project management, but we can apply it here to, um, to data quality, um, particularly as we think about building a more data-centric uh, approach to building ML models. Um, so if you think of data quality um, as a project requiring management, particularly given how many stakeholders it touches throughout and beyond an organization, um, we have various uh, various uh, various touch points. Um, so one would be the CDO or VP of engineering or CTO or whoever kind of sits at the top of the data org structure. Um, another would be the business intelligence teams. Um, a third would be the data science teams. Fourth, data engineering, then potentially data governance. Um, some companies even are developing, you know, product data or data product manager roles. And then obviously ML engineering is an important one as well as they touch the data too. Um, and they're responsible for building the models. So, um, you know, I'd imagine that um, ML engineering would be consulted or informed on the facilitate data accessibility um, uh, axis here 
and perhaps responsible for driving insights and recommendations based on data. Um, and when it comes to cleaning, wrangling, and testing, I'd imagine that ML engineers and data scientists would be accountable uh, for maintaining high data quality. Um, so I'd be curious for your thoughts on this during the Q&A. Um, it's obviously, you know, it, it varies on the org. Um, there's no right or wrong answer, but but what what does matter and what is important is that everyone aligns on aligns on it so that data quality um, and this data centric approach can be prioritized. Um, so next, um, I want to briefly talk about um, SLAs and. Um, SLOs in the context of, of your data. Um, so some of you may be familiar that setting SLAs, um, service level agreements, and SLOs, service level objectives, are two very foundational elements of, of DevOps. Um, but as we apply the same frameworks and mindset to MLOps um, or data observability, it's important um, to um, hold ourselves and our kind of um, other data stakeholders to the same to the same standards um, in terms of reliability. Um, so SLAs and SLOs track how reliable software is, um, i.e. Uh, five nines of availability, um, or we promise our customers that our service will only be down for five hours a week or whatever it is. That wouldn't be a particularly reliable service, but you get the idea. Um, and, um, you know, uh, to monitor these SLAs, um, they leverage USE, USE, and RED, R-E-D, metrics uh, to measure software reliability. Um, perhaps you've heard of them. Um, U stands for utilization, saturation, and errors, while RED stands for rates, errors, and duration. And these calculations give engineering teams a good idea of how reliable their systems are based on downtime and how well equipped um, or how well equipment is being utilized. And from there, what needs to be done to improve system performance. So similarly, uh, data teams can measure data reliability by setting SLAs and SLOs for data and leveraging novel metrics to track data downtime. Um, in other words, a period of time where data is missing or otherwise unreliable in the same way that, you know, a system downtime means that the system is unreliable. Um, so to do that, um, we've developed, or Bar and I have developed a kind of novel method of measuring this data downtime. Um, and so, you know, traditional methods of measuring data reliability are often time and resource intensive, as well as sort of um, not widely applicable across a variety of use cases. But we found that this metric is actually quite useful in terms of understanding how healthy and reliable your data is. So, um, so basically um, what it is, is the number of incidents that you experience or your company experiences over a given time, whether that's a, a data drift, um, you know, a poorly trained model, um, uh, like a broken pipeline, whatever it is, times the amount of time um, to detection and time to resolution for um, a given incident or for the sum of these incidents or whatever it is. Um, so, um, and then that would equal the amount of data downtime that your company is experiencing, experiencing over that given time period. So we found that this has been a very useful metric for many of our customers. Um, so hopefully um, if you are experiencing some of these issues and you're trying to work towards a more data-centric approach to model development, um, this uh, hopefully this can help you as well. Um, all right, now um, to wrap up here, um, you know, um, I want to leave you with a few key takeaways when it comes to applying data observability um, to your um, to your company and truly applying a data centric approach to building better machine learning. Um, so the first one is to um, set baseline expectations for your data. Um, this can be achieved through automatic threshold setting and custom rule generation as part of a robust data observability strategy. A second one is to monitor and alert for data anomalies before and during pipeline um, and model deployment across the five pillars of observability. The third would be to collect and apply rich metadata about your most critical assets with lineage. Um, as I mentioned, um, you know, there are, um, it, it can be a very powerful tool for understanding the impact um, of of uh, model and data issues. And there are automatic and ML driven ways of doing this at scale. Um, 
So do as the site reliability and observability engineers do and eliminate manual toil with automation when possible. Um, and finally, um, as I mentioned, mapping lineage between upstream and downstream dependencies to understand the business application of bad data, whether it's a poorly trained model or a stale dashboard powering poor decisions will make all the difference in terms of actually being actionable about uh, the data centric approach. Um, so at the end of the day, um, if we apply these takeaways and reframe ML around the data-centric approach, um, data quality and reliability will become second nature. Um, data observability helps us get to these fundamentals right by giving us the tools and frameworks necessary to truly embrace ML ops. And this sounds counterintuitive given that ML often has a natural desire to jump to the next shiny object, but we must go back to basics and invest in accuracy, integrity, and adverse in, in observability if we're going to build better ML models so that we can enable trust and confidence in data at scale. Um, so with that, um, I am happy to answer any and all questions you might have. Um, if you have um, any, any other questions that you don't ask today, feel free to reach out to me over email um, and be sure to visit our blog. We produce uh, new articles uh, every week on, on all of these topics. So thank you. I think you're muted, Karen. Oh, I have to unmute myself. Sorry, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> um, great. Uh, thanks so much, Molly. That was an awesome presentation. We do have a time for just a few questions. Um, really quickly, there were a few folks asking if this is going to be recorded, and yes, it is, and it'll be available within the platform uh, in about the next day or so. Uh, and then there's another question on if we can, if some folks are asking if we can uh, share the slides. So Molly, I'll, I'll let you answer that if we're able to yep. do that. Absolutely. Okay, uh, great. So we'll make sure we get those slides to you. I'm not exactly sure how, but we'll figure it out. What's the best way? Um, and then, okay, let's, let me see. Let me go back to this Q&A real quick. Uh, okay, we have a question from uh, Kunal. Uh, how does data observability reduce chaos engineering if any of those foundation pillars went missing? Um, yes, so um, I believe uh, Kunal is asking a question about using the five pillars for chaos engineering, I believe. Um, so if any, so if any of the five pillars go missing, um, it would be more challenging to identify, um, to, to, to conduct the entire incident management process for your data pipelines and models. So if you think about chaos engineering or um, site reliability engineering, if you don't have um, traces, then it makes it much harder. You, you can know that something went wrong, but it makes it much harder to understand um, where it went wrong in the system and what's, what other applications were impacted. So it's the same thing with the five pillars. Um, so for instance, if you are only tracking for volume or you're only tracking for freshness, um, then there may be things that slip through the cracks that are not related directly to that um, and may manifest in other ways like, um, like code changes, um, API issues, those can all um, affect data and those may not be reflected in just one of the pillars. So it's important to take a more holistic approach. Cool, okay, and we have, so we're able to get to one more question. So I do see that there's a few more. So um, I encourage you to maybe ask a chat with Molly on the platform um, for those who were not able to get to your questions. Uh, so last question real quick, Molly. Uh, Allison is asking, so given the importance of data observability and use of ML ops, it sounds like the responsibilities of a data science versus ML engineer are blurred. If I do the feature engineering, train the model, and also deploy the model, what's the line between data scientists and ML engineer? And what are some things to keep in mind for someone in that sort of blurred position? That's a, it's a tough one because I think that for many companies, it is very blurred um, and there's no right or wrong answer. I mean, I think, I think what I've heard is that um, the data science, like, at a lot of companies that I've spoken with, and even when I was back at Uber, the, the data scientist was sometimes interchangeable with data analyst, and the ML engineers were the ones who were um, like 
building the foundation and the infrastructure with which the data scientists would use to build their models and run their experiments. Um, so I think um, often what we're finding is that observability falls within the realm more so of ML engineering than data science, just because the data science team isn't always the one responsible for maintaining the underlying infrastructure. Um, but if you are at like a, a smaller company or um, a lot of startups, those those lines are blurred. Um, and it really is, it really kind of falls down to who is responsible for um you know, when, when you get that page in the middle of the night, who's the one who's on the, on the, um, on the line to fix it. Um, and I don't know that title is so much an indicator as, as your role and responsibility. Great. Well, thanks so much, Molly. We really, really appreciate you, uh, joining us today. And so with that, I'd like to our next speaker. So Amina, she's a principal engineer at Intel, and she is the director of Women in Big Data Northwest chapter. Uh, so with that, let's pass it to Mina. Hi. Uh, hi, everyone. Let me just share my files. Let me know when you can see my screen. Okay. Are you able to Okay. Okay, you should be able to see my screen now. Let me know. I'm trying to go to the full screen mode and swap the Okay. Okay, great. Um, I hope you can hear me fine. Um, Karen? Great. We can hear just fine. Okay, great. Okay, let me get started. Uh, hi, uh, hi, thanks everyone for um, this opportunity. Um, I'm, I'm uh, Meena Arunachalam. I'm from Intel Corporation. My topic is going to be slightly different. Uh, so uh, the talk was mostly, the earlier talk was excellent. Uh, my uh, co-speaker here, uh, Molly, spoke about data-centric um, uh, issues. And here I'm going to be talking about how you actually build end-to-end -end AI pipelines and how can you typically uh, sort of get the best out of your platform. By that, I mean the best uh, you know, like performance or software efficiency and hardware efficiency out of your entire solution. And what I do, I uh, lead a team um, that is responsible for architecting end-to-end -end AI pipelines and optimize them with appropriate uh, both hardware software code design, but also optimize the software libraries and software frameworks that data sent uh, data scientists, ML engineers, and developers use on a day-to-day -day basis and essentially make them understand what the hardware is uh, capable of and then essentially get the seamless performance boost that you're going to uh, get through these libraries and low-level ninja codes, but without actually doing it yourself, right? Okay, so let me go to the next file. So here um, I am um, showing you an uh, AI software stack. I mean, this is Intel stack, but then it can be pretty much, you know, uh, very common across many different platforms. So at the very, uh, it's a sort of a stacked view. At the very lowest level, you have the uh, libraries and compilers that are responsible for, you know, like for example, deep neural networks, data analytics library, math kernel library, uh, you know, uh, uh, performance primitives, uh, collective communications, threaded building blocks, many, many different low-level libraries and compilers. And how do you sort of get the really uh, sort of bare metal running and running on it and getting the best performance for all these primitives and low-level functions? And how do you integrate it with the 
higher level data scientist facing applications or frameworks, for example, the very popular frameworks and packages that you see in the next layer in the AI analytics packages, as well as the inference engines like TensorFlow or PyTorch or the uh, uh, very popular extreme gradient boosting that has won a lot of Kaggle competitions and Spark, MLlib and, and, and many other um, packages are going to get the benefit by just integrating with these lower level libraries. And then on top of it, again, another layer of model optimization. For instance, um, things like hyperparameter optimization or how do I sort of um, optimize and uh, give a framework where I look at the entire pipeline and make my resource utilization and my, um, you know, um, hyperparameter tuning such that I am able to not only run it in a performant way, but also get the high objectives such as hitting the accuracies and so on. Okay, and then uh, we also have things like a low precision automation tool. So for a lot of people, uh, you know that for neural networks, you don't really need 32 bits. You can represent it with eight bits, especially in like inferencing and things like that. So is there a way to sort of automate it? So low LPOT or low precision opt automation tool is an open source tool that we have where you can feed your model in and it, you can have a lot of tuning capabilities that will auto tune the model for you and auto quantize it. Yet, you know, at very little loss or almost no loss in accuracy essentially, which means you can finish your model a lot faster. And then again, we have a bunch of big data AI platforms uh, like Analytic Zoo with AI on Spark, Modin for scalable Python to be able to run with a single line of Python code. You can also run it on your laptop as well as a cluster or a cloud and then array DP. And then at the very top layer, somewhat, um, I think uh, Molly talked about it a lot about ML ops. So the entire deployment and more. This is a very efficient and very uh, capable framework that's going to, of some kind that you need to have, that will basically give you the um, ability to literally build the model, deploy the model, uh, manage data management sets and you know um, how how are these data sets changing over time? How do you keep them up to date? How do you keep the models up to date? and keep the training and, and everything current. Okay, so this is typical of any AI software stack, and this is one such stack that we have. So let me go to um, what typically the data scientist or the developer or the ML researcher really cares about, right? Or even the end customer. What they truly care about is the time to solution, right? Starting from data procurement in many cases the data may not even exist for what they set out what the question they're setting out to answer or the insights that they're trying to draw there may be some parts of the data are not all data is present or it's not all cleaned it's not all you know available in the form that the the particular modeling um, approach that they're going to take needs and so on so you need to procure data you need to clean the data you need to ingest the data and do a lot of data exploration and pre-processing and feature engineering and i think molly alluded to earlier a lot of the data scientists tell us that this is a phase of the end-to-end -end pipeline they spend a lot of time on, right? Whether it is like data, tabular data or visual data in any kind of modality, right? Vision or video or uh, textual data. There's a lot of time spent in getting the data ready for machine learning. Whether it is classical machine learning or deep learning, this process is, and, and the thing about this earlier stages is it's repeated many times. So you don't, like you set out to answer a question, you explore certain things, you go look at the data, you do all kinds of things, and then you repeat the process till you're satisfied with the model you're building. So, and then you do a lot of prototyping and, you know, uh, and building and experimenting, which is why it is very critical uh, to optimize and look at the full end-to-end -end pipeline and not just focus on the model building aspect. 
Okay, so I'm talking about data centric in the earlier uh, phases, but in, with the with the approach of making it performant, right? So packages like uh, pandas, you know, I'll talk about how we, uh, you know, we have this very exciting project called Modin that basically uh, overcomes the uh, inefficiencies of single threaded pandas, and we have to make it multi threaded, we have to make it parallel, we have to vectorize it, we have to make it more memory efficient, and so on. So, and then we have things like uh, the Python packages um, where you have XGBoost, Extreme Gradient Boosting, Scikit-Learn, you know, NumPy, SciPy, all of the things that are also need to be, um, you know, uh, basically optimized. As you know, it's interpreted language and it needs to be, um, you need to apply the compilation techniques and and uh, essentially uh, get the best performance out of the modern CPUs or GPUs or whatever the case may be. And then here again, I, we have the high level frameworks that most data scientists probably love to use, but then they don't want to be bothered to writing the low level assembly code or C code or even you know, bother about what lower level CPUs I'm using. What kind of vector instructions do I have? What special instruction set architecture am I programming to? Okay, so in a nutshell, what are we trying to do? We are trying to bridge the gap from ideation to results. So we start off with, you know, the data scientist starts off with some questions that they're setting out to answer, or the business uh, is trying to answer some questions, right? And how can we essentially get them to the results quickly? Number one. Number two, how can we allow them to, uh, you know, enable them to do more prototyping, more complex, more, uh, you know, sort of uh, innovative ideas that are going to require more and more cycles and more and more compute and uh, and larger data sets and so on. Uh, number two, we want them to have reproducibility. Um, you want it to be numerically compliant with existing APIs and standards that they have used, and you want it to be conformant. So it's not like we just want performance at any cost. It also has to be reproducible, consistent, and have high accuracy and very uh, high, um, you know, uh, you know, uh, confidence in the results. And then also be able to scale because the problems and the data sets that we are uh, looking at, even the model sizes are dramatically growing. Almost on a regular basis, we see newer papers coming, trying to do more and more, uh, more and more with AI, but then they also require you know, a uh, lot more compute and memory uh, footprint in the, in, the, in the data center to solve these problems. So essentially your software has to seamlessly also be able to scale so that the developer or the data scientist is kind of not having to uh, deal with this problem themselves. Okay, uh, so let's look at how do we do this? Um, so uh, I'll give you one example here, which is, um, so here we started off with uh, a TensorFlow, uh, a deep learning model called ResNet50. You probably, many of you have seen it for image classification. So we started off, I'm going to focus on the right over here. We started off with an FP32 baseline model, which is a floating point 32-bit uh, representation of the activations and weights and such in the model. And the rightmost bar over here is the roof line, meaning what the hardware is actually capable of. So if you didn't do anything to the software, took the software as is, the framework as is, this was a version 1.1.5, so it was taken on a particular uh, platform. And what all are all the things you need to do, right? So what we do, all these things seamlessly. So you have many, many cores and modern CPUs and GPUs and accelerators have more and more cores and more and more compute and uh, memory capability and they're growing uh, pretty rapidly. So your software has to leverage that, right? It has to scale, it has to uh, do better load balancing, uh, make sure that we don't spend or reduce the amount of synchronization events because anytime you have to synchronize between these cores or between these nodes, you're going to lose performance or waste some time. Uh, you need to have better parallelization techniques and enable things like you know, open MP or threaded building blocks. Uh, any any case, like I said, reduce the synchronization um, you know, when you're parallelizing as well. And uh, essentially also use vectorize, vectorization capability. So in CPUs, you have these VPU or vector processing units where you can have 
512 bit VPUs or vector widths, you know, in the current uh, generation Xeon CPUs. So you can do simultaneously 16 32 bit floating point multiply ads. Those are you know, number crunching workhorses for neural networks. And you can even do, you know, eight bits, you can do even more of those, right? So you need to able to be able to vectorize and not just vectorize. If the machine is capable of 100%, you need to make sure that your libraries and frameworks get to the and push the envelope as much as possible so that you can finish your uh, convergence and you can finish your runs a lot faster. Followed by things like memory management. Oh my God, this is so critical. Every time you need to move a byte around your CPU, you're going to be from your memory subsystem to the CPU to the cache and so on, you're going to be spending energy. And that is also going to cost performance, right? Because every hop is going to cost you in latency and that's going to be an expensive affair. So typical, uh, you know, um, basic practices in any software engineering or any person who's writing coding, you have to do good blocking or tiling of your data set so that you maximize your data reuse once you bring it to the fast, higher levels of your memory hierarchy into your caches. Make sure things like prefetching, um, memory layouts, how you are laying it out on your, uh, you know, caches are friendly to your frameworks and such. And last but not the least, graph optimization. So you have things like the, con the operations, the deep learning operations like batch normalizations, ReLU, or, uh, you know, these are going to be very critical um, how you sometimes you want to fuse them. You want to make sure that things like, um, you know, if it is a uh, inference pipeline, you don't really need to have batch normalization uh, happening all the time. So maybe you can uh, sort of fold that operation into a different node and then uh, and make it go faster. Um, and 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 you can also do things like uh, you know filter caching, like the convolutional filters. Maybe you can uh, that are repeatedly used in the inference time. You can just uh, get the right layouts that are optimal for the hardware and store it in the cache. So a lot of these things will happen in the lower level libraries and then get integrated with the higher level frameworks. And that's what you see here. So going from the first step, FP32 baseline to the FP32 optimized, you see a 85% bump in improvement in performance. Then when you go to the lower precision int 8 representation, then you can get another 70% bump. In this particular case, we also have hardware support for this particular instruction. It's called vector, vector neural network instruction. So you're able to see that big bump. And then going from int 8, um, I'm sorry, first is the software and then you get, get DL boost and you get it in hardware, you get an even bigger bump. So you can see because of all of these optimizations, you can essentially push your limit uh, to the roof line of the machine. Not only that, what, what, why are you seeing this? You're using less resources or you're trying to use resources more efficiently and you're going to memory less often and so on. So these are sort of the basic principles that help you get these optimizations. So let me give you some examples quickly uh, in the interest of time. Um, I will, uh, these are some examples of workloads I mean, you can say 285x improvement in performance for a ResNet 50 example here. Um, K, uh, K nearest neighbors, you know, classical ML algo, you're seeing a 227x. I will actually show you a demo and walk you through some code. And then you will see how simple and easy it is to drop just one line of code change and then get this improvement just by using the Intel extensions for scikit-learn. Um, here is a New York City taxi data. It's a workload that has, you know, I think 2009 to 15, 2015 uh, New York uh, City taxi uh, from some three or four boroughs, a billion rows of taxi data, the publicly available data, and how you can pretty much use things like uh, persistent memory with Modin and be able to completely do the analytics on this on your one single uh, two socket Xeon, which is not possible with any accelerator, right? So you need this persistent memory to manipulate large data sets. Okay, so um, let's go to this um, and uh, look at, uh, this is an end-to-end -end AI workload. So this is um, uh, from a Kaggle challenge, a plastic workload. And here um, you can see that um, 
Typically, an end-to-end -end workload, like I said, you have a data ingestion phase. You're reading the data from disk into, or sometimes it's in a compressed form. You have to decompress it, and you bring it into a CSV file. Uh, in this particular case, it's tabular data, time series data. And then you do some extraction, transformation, loading, feature engineering, pre-processing, and things like that that you're doing here. And then followed by building a machine learning model with an extreme XG boost model here. And then you're building for training, and then you're doing inference. But notice the green portion is the unoptimized code, and the blue one is the optimized code. Believe it or not, just by using two lines of code, uh, you can import Modin, and you can import the XG boost. I mean, XG boost is actually we are upstreaming the optimization. So you pre pretty much get the latest and greatest XGBoost. We also distribute it with Intel distribution of Python. You can see this. The last bar, the red bar, is further optimizing the hyperparameters. So fundamentally, by ch you know changing the number of trees, the depth of the trees, and how many trials you want to go through, you can really uh, set these objectives and say, I want to hit at least this much accuracy, and I want to minimize my runtime, you can actually see dramatic improvements, right? OK, so let me walk through a couple of more slides, and then I will show you the demo. So this is uh, Intel extension for scikit-learn. And what happens if everybody starts, let's say, with the C++ baseline? So number one, we optimize the math routines, the basic linear algebra subroutines, the BLAST libraries. We have the Intel's famous math kernel library for all x86 CPUs. You apply that, you get a big boost in performance. All the MATMULs and MAT vector operations are all op optimized. Then you, we also do better threading in our DAL library. So you know, make use of all the cores and all the threads that are available. We also have advanced vectorization. That's going to give you a big boost. And then as the generations from SSE to 256-bit to AVX2 to AVX512, you keep going through advanced vectorization that automatically, seamlessly, um, scale and you get the benefit. And the memory optimizations going from generation to generation to generation, again, is seamlessly uh, uh, realized. And then last but not the least, as the newer and newer architectures keep coming, this is like, you know, the software is ready while the hardware is launched. So it's kind of lockstep. You get the benefit together. And then we are also looking at scaling out of these algorithms that we support as well with scikit-learn. So, here is a foil that just shows you on the left is how you would use scikit-learn. I'm just showing you only a few examples with scikit-learn because there's many different algorithms and packages, but I just wanted to show and sort of motivate you with a couple of examples. So here you would basically scikit-learn SVM, it's support vector machine, and you're importing the support vector classification. All you will have to do is just add these two lines. You basically import the scikit-learn extensions you import the patch, and then you patch scikit-learn. Voila, you have your optimized um, scikit-learn that you can run. OK, so now let's look at if I go do the fit, the training, or the inferencing part with this scikit-learn, what kinds of performance we will, you will see. So here is Intel's extension for scikit-learn. And you see the, uh, you know, th these are variety of k-means k that are both fit and predict. Um, with different numbers of features, different sample sizes, different cluster sizes, and so on. You can see that you can get anywhere from, you know, 3.6x all the way to 221x on the same hardware. I didn't change anything except added the two lines. And unlike a lot of our competitor, we actually are when we say we are scikit-learn, we are not scikit-learn, like we are actually scikit-learn, meaning your APIs will not change, your numerical conformance, mathematical equivalence will not change, and as, a, as you know, vetted by the, and defined by the scikit-learn consortium, okay? So let me also show you what this means on a simple general purpose CPU with the power of optimized software. So 1.0 is, let's say, uh, the Intel Xeon uh, optimized software, what you can bring, and the uh, orange and the green bars are what you can get out of AMD Rome and then um, um, you know Nvidia V100. So one is one means that you know that is a better you know performance is better than all of these other um, uh, hardware platforms, right? So the power of software can be dramatic and huge, and essentially 
make your life much, uh, you know, much better. So I'm going to show you one more example, and then sh I'll show you the demo. This is an extreme gradient boost uh, application. Um, I uh, here we are using the histogram method. And then on different data sets, anywhere from few hundred megabytes to gigabytes of data sets, we are running the gradient boosting algorithm. And with every release of XG Boost, we are always upstreaming newer optimizations and pull requests have been happening. And essentially, and anytime I talk to the analytics team, they'll say, oh, we have more coming, you know, with more, CP more newer generations and more optimizations, you're going to push the envelope more. So let me show you here. Um, this is just one example because we further optimize it with one DAL. XGBoost is standalone package. We further optimize it uh, using this inference option inside of one DAL because there is no reason to do this uh, DM, uh, you know, data matrix conversion um, type. If you save on that, you can basically because inference is once you create the model, you are continuously doing inference on it and. You, without any loss in accuracy, as you can see, the accuracy is identical for both light GBM, that's another gradient boosting package, as well as for extreme gradient boost, you can see huge speed ups in performance. Okay. So how do we realize all this? Again, I went through in the very beginning what we do in Vandal. So let me talk about what XGBoost optimizations were done. So things like memory prefetching to mitigate irregular memory accesses. So on the left is the pseudocode for XGBoost baseline, and on right is the optimized XGBoost. Um, you can do nested parallel, better nested parallelism for the, you know, the decision tree nodes that we are building. Uh, using uh, unsigned integer 8 instead of integer 32, you're, you're moving fewer bits, but, you know, uh, more elements. Um, advanced parallelism for samples and partitioning and reducing the sequential loops. And then more things are in progress about vectorizations and using a single instruction, multiple da data, SIMD instructions through our AVX units. Okay, now let me um, show you one example. I'm going to get out of the slide mode um, here. And I'm going to walk you through, I'm going to stop sharing for a second and then share screen again. Okay, let me know if you can see my screen. Okay, are you able to see my screen? Yes, we can. Okay. Okay, so here is a um, popular digit recognizer. So this is a Kaggle notebook. Any, any of you can go try it, by the way, on any Kaggle notebooks or any notebook you want. Um, so this is a digit recognition. So the famous handwritten digits that we have seen, right? Like zero through nine, and then this huge data set that was created by MNIST. And typically for computer vision, you will go with a, a CNN, a convolutional neural network. But in this example, the author decided to also try a classical ML, a KNN approach. So here uh, we have, I'll just walk you through the code quickly. It's a very small notebook, and then I will actually run it. In the interest of time, I picked a small problem with a small data set. So it will run in literally uh, less than a minute. So here I have this K nearest neighbor. So I am going to import a bunch of you know imports over here, and this is using the uh, scikit-learn extension, Intel scikit-learn extension, and I'm patching with the scikit-learn. And uh, then I'm reading that data into the training data set, into a data frame test data set, and the submission data frame and then doing some information on it and looking at what those uh, data sets look like. These are nothing but 28 by 28 images of these digits, handwritten digits, right, from zero through nine. And the, the, the workload is basically classifying by looking at the image, whether it is a zero, one, two, or whatever, what the correct uh, label for that particular data is. And that's what it's doing. And before I go off and build the model, I'm doing some stratified k fold uh, which is basically to make sure that um, you know there is enough cross validation across the different parts of the and different samples or different representations of the samples and i'm using some grid search to make sure that my um, data set is you know cross validated but also fine tuned the uh, and pick the right 
uh, parameters for n neighbors and distance and things like that for the uh, hyperparameters. And then uh, the author also goes and does some data augmentation, things like you know shifting, uh, rotating uh, the uh, the picture, clipping, zooming, and things like that, so that you can grow your data set and get a you know slightly better accuracy for training. And that's what all these functions do. And then finally, you do the training with the combined uh, data set, and then you get the runtime. So this literally took 69 seconds, but I will actually, if you don't mind, show you very quickly. I am going to restart and go here. So you see this Intel extension was uh, enabled. The import of that extension happened. And then I'm going to follow the code. All these portions have finished running. Uh, we are here. It's put, pushed all the confusion matrices and the uh, classification report that came out of um, scikit-learn. Um, and then here is the estimator. Wow, it's going really super fast. So right now it's doing data augmentation where this uh, that's running right now. And then once the augmentation is done, um, let's see where we are going. We are here um, combining the data set. Or we're still in the augmentation phase, sorry. Okay, I don't know if I lost my uh, putty connection. No, I did. I, did. I do have my connection. It finished. Yep, I am okay. Um, it's still running and it finished. Okay, it completed. So basically, the runtime took around 70 seconds. It normally takes even less, but I don't know. Maybe I have too many windows open and the network is slow. OK, so then I want to show you uh, what quickly what would happen if you didn't. I'm not going to run it for you. I took a video because it the, the time in the stock is not going to be enough to run the workload. So if I did not use the scikit-learn optimized extensions, for some reason, it's going to my other window. Let me other screen. Sorry, let me just pull it. I don't know why it doesn't want to move to this screen. Okay, okay, for it's running on the other window for some reason. <laughs> okay, there I was able to grab it. So here, uh, I won't run the whole workload, but it's exactly the same workload. What I want to show you is it here. It is just not using the scikit-learn extensions, right? So if you run it without that, um, exact same code, same notebook. Uh, let me just drag the mouse to the very end. It will finish running. It will literally take, uh, I think, um, 438 seconds. So, so almost six and a half x times slower than the um, optimized runs. So this is just an example, and I hope you get motivated um, to go try it out. And like I was showing in my talk, you can also get all of these optimized libraries from the uh, one uh, AI analytics toolkit. I went through it really fast. If you go to this website, you can download all these libraries and play with it. And, they, and several of these are open source, and you can actually uh, take a look at this. Okay. That's all I had, and I know I went over time. I sort of started a little late, so apologize for that. But I am happy to answer any questions. Cool. Thanks so much, Mina. Uh, yeah, we definitely we have a few questions, um, and thanks for everyone for sticking around a little later, um, and we can answer a few. I'm just going into the Q and A. Um, Okay, we have one. Um, are these extensions specifically for the machines uh, having Intel processors? They are for any x86 CPUs, right? But uh, they they will be more optim. I mean, meaning we uh, we can only optimize them for the particular features that are there in the hardware. 
So we have tuned them for, for instance, VNNI or you know, vector neural network instructions or AVX512 and so on. So if it's available in another CPU, by all means, it, it might work, right? But it's the x86 instruction set architecture. Okay. And next question. Um, can you do all the parallelizing parallelizing and vectorizing on your local host before going to the cloud? Absolutely. Why not? As long as your hardware um, has the ve vector. In fact, nowadays, even client CPUs are coming with it, right? Workstations and clients, which is the mode a lot of data scientists operate in. And then they go deploy it in the cloud uh, by all means. By the way, I want to also want to mention one more thing. All these libraries are sort of multi um, targets meaning it will also work on our intel gpus and you know other targets like fpgas and such so we are working to you know widen the scope not just keep it for cpus right okay uh and then a question from tessa uh so you have these extensions for all the packages you showed previously uh tensorflow xgboost etc yes intel in um it's called intel itex uh, Intel TensorFlow extension, IPEX, Intel PyTorch extensions, uh, Intel optimization for Modin, Intel extensions for scikit-learn, and so on. So there are, yeah, ev everything has uh, these extensions, correct? Okay, cool. Uh, and then how about last question uh, from Pamela. Uh, when I hear about moving data from various locations to cache, I think about cost in cloud. Are you or your team made aware of this or asked for input? Um, so, sorry, can you repeat the first part of the question? The, uh, when you try to move the data from uh, cached cloud, you said? Yeah, sorry, the question jumped. Um, when I hear about moving data from various locations to cache, I think about cost in cloud. Okay, great question. So I think what I think the question, at least I'll try to, I, the way I understand is, when you have an end-to-end -end pipeline, take a video analytics pipeline, right? So you have cameras that are collecting data, live data, and then digital surveillance kind of a, a scenario. And they're collecting at the edge, and then there are edge servers, and the edge is collecting the data, and the cloud is probably sitting somewhere far. So you have these serv service, I guess, SLAs, they're called, service level agreements. You need a response within a certain time. So you're not always going to do everything on the cloud. Certain things are better off left at the edge, right? And I think there's a new term called edge cloud also, right, that they talk about. So um, right there, you know, yes, that those are the things you need to realize when, when can I do things right where the data is being generated versus shipping it off to the cloud, right? Great. Well, I think that's that's all the time we have for questions. Um, and if there are, are, I think there's a few we, we weren't able to get to, but I encourage you to uh, chat with Mina in the virtual platform. Um, and so with that, I just want to do a quick uh, thank you to Mina and Shaula and Molly. Thank you so much for joining us for this meetup on the second day of Summit. Um, and thank you to all the attendees for joining us. And I hope you have a great rest of your week. Um, we have a ton of awesome content coming up. Um, so uh, thank you so much. And everyone, have a great rest of your day. Take care. Thank you, Karen. Thank and you. thank you to all of Take you. Care. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.